Thank you very much for listening to this edition of the Morning Life Radio Show. This is a beautiful, beautiful Monday, Martin Luther King Day. I thank you guys for tuning in, 4.30 Eastern here Monday. I'm here in beautiful St. Petersburg, Florida. It's, it's a wonderful day out here. And, um, you know, if you're listening to this show right now, obviously I will be doing an interview. He's on the line right now with a fellow podcast member of mine. He does the show Salamonster Sounds Off. He's actually been an inspiration to me to actually start doing wrestling podcasts because I listen to his show every single week and He's, a, he's very, very good at what he does. He's a great inspiration. I love his segments. I love the way he does his show. He's 100% honest with how he feels. And it's an honor to have him come on to my podcast. You know, uh, uh, my podcast, we just got started six months ago. It's doing pretty well. And to thank him for taking the time to come on the show, we're going to talk a little wrestling and talk from the beginning to now. Let's go ahead and bring him in right now. What's up, man? You're on the air. Antoine, how are you, my friend? Hey man, I'm good, man. It's good. It's good for you, you know, that you that you that you decided to come on, man. I definitely appreciate it you coming on to the show, man. How you doing this lovely day? I I am doing very well, and you know, after that intro you gave me, I think it's all downhill from here. I I, I should probably <laughs> just hang up at this point. <laughs> nah, man, don't do that, man. Don't do that, man. A lot oh my of people God. Was actually excited to um to have you on, man. I'm very excited. I just got done listening to your last episode. Was it three ten, I believe? Yeah, yeah, three ten. Yeah, man, I just got done listening to that. Listen, I love you. I love your reviews, man, and um, I love when he was talking about Daniel Bryan and how um, <laughs> and how he didn't remember how he had the concussion and he barely remembered. It's kind of kind of like it's kind of um a bad situation because one of the most probably the most memorable memorable night he's had, he probably won't remember it. So, um, you did yeah, a great yeah, job, I mean, man. One the, yeah, one of the one of the best nights of his career, and when people ask him questions about it, he has no idea what happened. <laughs> Definitely, man. So let's start from the beginning, man. And you know, we're gonna do this in how I'm gonna do this is I'm gonna ask you first, how did you become when what you know, what how did you become a wrestler fan? What's your earliest recollection of, of wrestling, of the of wrestling all over the place? Of WWE, WCW, what was your first recollection of wrestling? My my first recollection of wrestling was WWF because I, I grew up in the Northeast and right. uh I think you may have also grown up in the Northeast, is that right? Yes, I'm I'm from I'm from where you're at, man. I'm from uh from Queens, New York, man. I'm fr- I know you're okay, probably not well, from Queens, but I'm from I'm from Queens. No, I well I'm I'm familiar with it, but th- that was pretty much WWF territory at the time and, and still is. So, yeah, I grew up on that, and it was just a family thing, you know. My father, my grandfather, uh, th- they actually would sometimes watch the NWA on TBS Saturday nights and drag me over to watch it, and it had no interest in watching it, but. Yeah, I watched it anyway, and it's funny now, I look back on those days, and I kind of miss, I feel like I missed out on it by not paying more attention to it. Right, right, and I, I understand, man, so you's a, what, what, uh, around what time was this, was this around the time Hogan uh, was really on, uh, in, in his prime, or was it uh, a little bit later, well, what was around the time frame? Oh, yeah, Hulk, Hulkamania was running wild at that time, uh, he, he was pretty much the number one guy, Macho Man, Roddy Piper. Ricky Steamboat, those kind of guys. So we're talking the mid to mid to late '80s period is when I really got into it. '87 ish, I would say. Uh, that was the first time I went to a live show over at uh, Madison Square Garden. So, you know, all those guys. There were all these big, colorful characters, and and how could you not like wrestling back then? Right, man. You're absolutely right, man. I remember, you know, I'll give you a little bit of my history. Um, I'm I'm 20, about to be 26, and uh, my first pay per view that I remember watching in this entirely was WrestleMania 8. Um, WrestleMania 8 was, uh, you know, Ric Flair versus Macho Man, the the Hogan versus uh, Sid Justice phenomenon that I had to watch through. <laughs> no, um, you know, uh, you know, I had to watch. Well, yeah, you, 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 you mentioned you mentioned WrestleMania 8, though. That that is one of my favorite WrestleMania shows of all time. So you you yeah. you started right around the uh, right around a good time there because ninety two. It's funny we uh, we just got on the show here, but this morning I had a little bit of time, and uh, I, I'm going off topic here a little bit. But WWE, of course, they got this new network starting, and for years now they've had this classics on demand service, which my cable provider happens to carry. So I've been a subscriber now for a while, and it's great. And I noticed that this morning they had a whole bunch of Royal Rumble matches on demand, and they had my favorite one from 92. So I watched it. It brought me back to that period. That year, I'm telling you, man, that was a good year in WWF. Maybe not business-wise, but as a fan, I love 1992. 
Oh yeah, speaking of that Royal Rumble, man, that Royal Rumble had the who's who in it. Davy Boy Smith, the one Rick that's the one Rick Flair won, Sid Vicious, I Sid Justice at the time. You had Hogan, Macho Man, Jake the Snake, you had so many so many different angles going on at that time. I wish uh, WWE really dropped the ball in the future by never doing anything like that again, putting the who's who of talent in the Royal Rumble. And you really had no idea who was gonna win at that time, which was great. You had some people I really, you know, you, a lot of people thought Hogan was going to win. Some people thought Vicious was going to win. You really didn't know at that, well, at that uh, Rumble. And, um, well, I, I got to say, though, you know, not to toot my own horn here, but I, it's funny. I, w- I was a lot younger back then. And right. I can say that I predicted Flair would win the Rumble. And I can't take too much credit for it. I told the story on my show before. But the reason I knew Flair was going to win, this was my first exposure to the behind the scenes kind of wrestling, the news of wrestling, because back then they had newsletters and hotlines and stuff like that. And I vividly remember being in school at the time. We were on recess, and there was a phone booth on the first floor of the building. And a whole bunch of guys just huddled into the phone booth around this receiver. And I couldn't imagine what what they were in there for. As they came out, they were talking to each other, saying, oh, you know, Ric Flair is going to win the Royal Rumble. And I thought to myself, well, how do these guys know? So I went, you know, home and watched it with my family. And they asked me, who do you think is going to win? And I said, oh, uh, Ric Flair. And they looked at me like I had a third eyeball in the middle of my head. And, you know, the Rumble match happened, and sure enough, Ric Flair won, and I looked like the biggest hero in the room when the match was over. <laughs> it's, it's crazy how, you know, um, our early recollections of, of, of wrestling and our favorite memories. So let's start from the beginning, and we're going to do this in chronological order till today. And I'm going to ask you questions in, in, in the middle of that to today, so everything goes in a nice order form. Now, what is your opinion on the era that, a little bit before the era that I started watching it, of the Hogan's, the Jake, the Snakes? You was around watching it at that time. And what was your opinion on that on that era of Rick of Rick Rude, Jake the Snake, Honky Tonk Man of that era? Did you you know did you um was it was was it a golden period at that time of wrestling in your opinion? Oh yeah, I mean, well to me you're asking the wrong person here because I'm biased towards that era. I love that era, uh, but I I think ge- just generally speaking that whole period was the golden age of wrestling if you think about it because you still had a lot of different groups back then. You had WWF, you had WCW, but you had a lot of you know, you still had a lot of different territories. So depending on where you grew up in the country, you had your own brand of wrestling. And if you go back even into the early 80s, you had Florida and you had Texas and you had Portland. You had all these different places that were so known for their wrestling, Memphis and everything else. So I think that whole decade was was the final real golden period of pro wrestling. And then when the 90s rolled around, I mean, I love the 90s also, but it was different. You know, it wasn't the same. Wrestling itself kind of changed. The characters changed. There wasn't as many groups out there. Uh, I look back fondly, though, on that late 80s period. I And I think there's a lot of things from that period that are not so old school that they can't be used today. You know, man, you make a very great point, and I want people to really understand this because I grew up on that era. I was just watching wrestling, as, you, as, as I said, 92, right when that era, right when the shift was coming. But I always, the first, I could say the first full, full pay-per-view I remember was um, WrestleMania 8. But the first matchup I remember in its entirety from a kid that I can go, I can remember almost every move was Hogan versus Warrior, WrestleMania 6 in Toronto. And um, I can actually say I remember that match in its entirety. And this leads me to another question because you're around that time and this leads us to bring in, and as we're staying in generations, brings me to the Warrior. Because I see that as he's recently been inducted into the Hall of Fame, that a lot of lack of characters are in the business nowadays. And I think the Warrior doesn't get a lot of credit for the actual time he put into that character. Yes, he's kind of weird, obviously. That goes without saying. But when you look at you know, his, obvious, obvious, um, his, his character, excuse me, how can I say this? His character, but only the way he played that character and how at that time you could obviously say if anybody was as big and popular as, at, at, that could rival Hogan's popularity, it was Warrior. So give me your opinion on the Ultimate Warrior, his, not only his character, but him coming back to the WWE now. Yeah, I mean, he was, I think character is a great word for it. He was out of his mind. You know, I mean, even back then when I was younger, and didn't necessarily have a full concept of all these things. I would listen to his promos. I had no idea what he was trying to say, but it sounded cool. You know, when you would watch an Ultimate Warrior promo, it just sounded cool. And it, it, I mean, this guy looked like he was going into convulsions sometimes. He was just a really whack, whacked out kind of guy. But I think that's what made it fun. And, and, you know, one of the things about the Warrior character that I liked, forget the promos, 
just the energy. Like when he would come out, he would run down to the ring at a million miles an hour. He would shake the ropes like a madman. And what, where else are you going to find a guy as jacked up as somebody like he was back then with the face paint and multicolored tassels dangling from these bulging muscles. I mean, there's, there's, no, there's no other form of entertainment where you could possibly find something as ridiculous as that. Uh, but I, so that aspect of the Warrior I liked. I was not a huge Ultimate Warrior fan. I guess if you want to go along party lines, are you a Hogan guy or a Warrior guy? I was a Hogan guy. So, you know, at the end of WrestleMania six, I was kind of devastated. But I, I think Warrior coming back is is pretty cool. I mean, we know there's been a lot of bad blood between him and, and the company in uh, in recent years. I think it's been something like 16 years since he's been back with them. So it's been a while. And, you know, he deserves a spot in the Hall of Fame. I mean, they're putting in a lot of the guys who, you know, were, were I don't want to say carry the company, but they they want to put a lot of the big stars from their heyday in there. you got to put Warrior in there. Whether you like the guy or not, take a look at some of the guys they have in the Hall of Fame right now and, and tell me <laughs> that Warrior doesn't at least belong somewhere in there. It's, it's ridiculous. You know, and I actually saw that um that that letter that you posted the the letter that Vince wrote the Warrior um that you will that people obviously have, have taken from you uh no name no blame won't name anybody's other companies that on this radio show but obviously people don't want to give credit where it's due and I was actually listening to your recent podcast and the story that you told about um him doing uh, uh like speeches live speeches and I'm like you know. It just it just goes to show you how Vince and how that company can bold face lie, and it just goes to show you that you can't trust everything that's being said, being shown in front of you. Like they said, like they always say, at the end of the day, you got to look out for yourself, especially when you have somebody over you in business because they will lie on you, and they owe they they distinctly owe the Ultimate Warrior a distinct apology. And I hope, like you said, like you said on your uh, recent podcast, that Vince does the right thing and give that man an apology because as nuts so as Ultimate Warrior is, he didn't deserve that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I wouldn't hold my breath on that on that apology, but you know, it, it's just they built they built almost an entire DVD around this this bogus story. And uh, you could say a lot of things about the Ultimate Warrior. I'm not saying he was an angel. I'm not saying he wasn't crazy and he wasn't very demanding. You know, for every positive Ultimate Warrior story I've heard, I've heard five other ones that aren't so great about the kind of guy he he was or you know how he conducted himself. But yeah, that that was a pretty glaring I think story as far as you know, try to peddle something like that on uh, on the DVD. I mean, no wonder he was upset about it. I'm just saying my point of view is that he has every right to be upset about it. But the DVD, that was many years ago. He's getting a new DVD now. He's going to get the Hall of Fame treatment. You know, everybody's going to have wonderful things to say about the Ultimate Warrior now that he's back in the good graces of the company. And uh, I guess he's put it past it. He's put it in the past, so I guess everybody else can now, too. Yeah, and um, I actually have heard many stories, and I can actually remember ordering that DVD off of Amazon, and I remember ordering it, and um, I remember, you know, this has nothing to do with the story, but just goes to show, I remember when I was working at this little grocery store, uh, retail grocery store at the time, and uh, I saved up my money. And I was like, man, I was like 15, 16 at the time, and I was like, man, I want to buy this DVD. So I bought that DVD, and I remember watching it, and I fell asleep through some of it because all it was was just pretty much putting the man down. So I woke up, I woke up from my from my nap, and I watched it over again. And the first thing I thought, I was like, I've never seen a DVD like this where they trash a man. And you never get the other side of the story. It's just like Vince seemed like he had so much animosity towards the man that – um. You know, you put out an unprofessional, very unbusinesslike DVD like this, and I, 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 I didn't like it. And uh, to this day, it's in my it's in my garage, uh, catching dust, man. I refuse to watch that DVD because I know, regardless of what, I, even though I came out of, I, it was like the way that you guys saw, um, the way that you guys at that time saw Hogan versus Warrior live, especially when you watched it. That was the way I kind of saw Bret versus Shawn Michaels in the Iron Man match, even though I thought the match went on a lot too longer than it should have, but. That's kind of like how it was at that time when you got two guys that you like, and you kind of don't know which side to go. I'm a huge Bret Hart fanatic. That's that's my guy, but um, you kind of don't know which well, way you to mentioned, go. Well, well, just to tie it into the Warrior story here, I mean, you mentioned Bret Hart. It's not just limited to the Warrior. I mean, that's just how promoters, Vince, whatever, that's just how they do things. I, I still remember the story, and I don't know if you're aware of this, that when Bret first kind of mended fences with Vince McMahon. It was actually back, I think it was like 2006. That was around the time he went into the Hall of Fame. 
Right. And he didn't go on television. He didn't, you know, show up on Raw or wrestle a match or anything like that. But part of the deal that they reached was for Brett to come down to their studios and have a hand in making a DVD of his career. And they did, like, this big three-disc Bret Hart DVD set of his greatest matches. The reason he did that is because they had uh, greenlit a DVD called Screwed. That was going to be the name of the DVD. And they were going to do a very similar piece, kind of very similar to what they did for The Warrior, where they talked about, you know, Brett got, how Brett got screwed and how he was full of himself and he was, you know, difficult to work with. And they were going to have all these people commenting about how Brett was wrong for, you know, what happened in Montreal. And Brett didn't want that. So he, you know, swallowed his pride. He shook hands with Vince. He participated in the making of the DVD, and it never happened. But they had that on the schedule. They were going to come out with a DVD called Screwed, and the only reason we never saw it is because Brett made a deal with Vince. Wow. So, wow. I never knew this story. And this is honestly, this is my, that's my favorite wrestler of all time. So that, that, oh, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Is, that is kind of. They started filming interviews with people. Wow. I mean, I don't know how far along they were. I don't know if the DVD was done, but if it wasn't done, they had started working on it. And Brett said, I don't want this to be my legacy. I'll, I'll come back and, you know, I'll work on a, a more complimentary DVD. And so it never saw the light of day. But Vince was ready. He was like, all right, well, this guy's not going to come back. The hell with him. Let's, let's come out with a, with a hit piece like we did for Warrior. But it just never happened. So that, the good, great piece of information. You're, you're live right now on the Mortal Life Radio Show, 4.54 p.m. Eastern. Beautiful Monday, Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King holiday. Uh, thank you to everybody who's listening right now. Um, you know, that brings me to another question because there's so many questions I want to ask you to get your opinion on as a fellow wrestling fan. Do you think that the WWE is kind of like bully sometimes, man? Uh, sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes, really? Uh, I, I would say probably more than sometimes. I don't know what yeah. you're watching. <laughs> yeah, I would say you know, I you know, there's some situations, man. I watch and I just see. I was like, man, these guys are some. They some bullies. Right, come on, man. Antoine, star, Antoine, be a star. I, I know, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, yeah. Let's not bully the kids, but you know, let's not bully the kids, but let's have Ryan right, right back on Lily and Horseface and and um, Seamus' character goes out there and bullies people. But let's be a star. Let's not bully people. But you know, that just goes to show you how the WWE is nowadays. So let me ask you a question on about Bret Hart, and it goes to the next generation. You got, you had, you had Rick Rude. You had. You know, Ted DiBiase, Bret Hart was part of that previous era with the Hart Foundation. You had the British Bulldogs. You had many great tag teams. Now you transition into the new era. Hogan leaves um, after WrestleMania 9, after losing the Yokozuna, the King, uh, the, after that King of the Ring pay-per-view where he actually lost clean to Yokozuna. And, um, you know, you um, transfer to the next era. What did you think about that, that, that new generation era with Bret, Sean, Razor, Diesel? What did you think about that whole era in general? I, I was a fan of it. I, it wasn't the golden age of wrestling that we were just talking about, but, I mean, they had a lot of really talented guys on the roster. I was a huge Bret Hart fan like you were at that time. I thought Bret was great. I still think Bret, Bret's one of the greatest of all time when it comes to actually working a match. Yeah. Uh, I still say to this day, I can't remember, especially like a headline guy in one of the main promotions, I can't remember a guy who could convincingly take a beating during a match like Bret Hart. When I would see him get his butt kicked all over the place, it looked and it felt like he was really getting his butt kicked, and, and he was really good at that. But you had Brett, you had Owen, you had the Bulldog, you had the one two three kid you had guys like Hakushi. I mean, you know, I've said before, like 1995 is, in my opinion, one of the worst years in, in WWF history. Easily. But they had a lot of talented guys, so I, I'm a fan of that era. I, I liked it a lot, actually. I was a bigger fan of, of WWF back then than I was WCW. Right. At WCW, man, we, you know, you had uh, who? Jim Hurd, Bill Watts. You had so many guys all over the place at that time. That's back when Eric Bischoff, I think, was just starting to get get some power. So that, I didn't care for WCW back then, and I don't even want to talk about it until later on in the interview, until we get later in the years, because at that time, there was really nothing to talk about with WCW. So at that time, I was watching, you know, that's the time I started getting a little older and recognizing that. I started recognizing 
uh, really good work rates and really good guys who could wrestle. In that time, it was really work rate based, where guys wasn't really larger than life stars. You had guys that were really just performing in the ring very well. I think that the characters that was created was horrible, just my personal opinion. Some of the characters, um, you know, Duke the Dumpster Drozzy and, you know, and Bastion Booger and all these. I mean, oh, my God. It was horrible at that time, and it was crazy. I kind of wish, you know, I didn't actually was, was growing up fully at that time because it was such a bad time and watching it sometimes. But you had guys like Brett. You had guys like Sean. You had guys like um, you had uh, Razor Ramon who could put on a great match. I always said Brett and Sean could put an ass whooping, can get it, can get an ass whooping like nobody believe and make you believe it. Especially back in the day for Shawn Michaels. Back in the day, we could fly all over the place. It was very good to watch. So you transition from that small time for maybe you say the '94 era to early '97. Then you get to the Attitude Era. I want to ask you, man, because you have a very good perspective on this. What was the best part of the Attitude Era and the worst part? Because there were some bad things. Well, in your opinion. I think the best part of the Attitude Era was the fact that they they did, and I hate to keep bringing up WCW, but they did what WCW never did, which is they pushed new guys on top. And so what happened is they, and and maybe they were pushed into it because they had no choice, but a lot of their big stars went away. Hogan, Savage, Piper, DiBiase, all these guys went somewhere else. So they started pushing new faces. And what ended up happening is all those faces got over at the same time. So we talked about a golden era earlier. You could say the next golden era was, that period of 98, 99, because they got very lucky in that Stone Cold and The Rock came along at the very same time. And I don't know that we'll ever have another period like that in in history, maybe not in our lifetimes, where you have two stars like that who come around and come into their own at the exact same time. So, like, for example, when Austin went down and he was hurt, Rock was there to pick up the slack and Triple H and all those guys. So that's one aspect of the Attitude Era that I think was good. The other aspect of the Attitude Era that I liked, and and this is, I wish something they would get more, uh, they would bring back into the product now, is the realism and the seriousness of it. It's fine to joke around and have comedy and all that, and you had DX back then. It wasn't all, you know, serious all the time. But if you look at those main event guys and you look at the main event feuds, Austin versus Rock, Austin and Triple H, Rock and Triple H, Undertaker and Foley, there was nothing kind of funny about them you know those guys took what they did very seriously the promos they cut reflected that the promos weren't as scripted and as rehearsed as things are now and it just felt like you know what these guys really do want to just kick the hell out of each other and it felt like everybody hated everybody and and this kind of goes back to 97 a little bit you mentioned 97 that's what i liked the most about that period you felt like these guys were at war And when you're a wrestling fan, that's what you want to see. You don't want to see guys on top coming out and cutting corny jokes all the time. So I I really like that aspect. Yeah, I know what a, what a novel concept that is keeping comedy out of the main event. But uh, that, that's one of the the key things about the attitude era that I miss through all the hokey stuff and, you know, Vince Russo and May Young in the hand. And I mean, we could get into all that kind of stuff, but at the top, forget the mid card at the top, what those guys were doing is uh, something I think that we're really lacking in wrestling right now. Yeah, man. If I could go back from the differences of then and that time, I was in middle school. I was all over wrestling. Was it fake? I remember the first time I, I ever even – I always defended wrestling was real for years, and I, I didn't even know it was scripted. I remember the first time I actually found out it was scripted, man. It did. That, I, I took that worse to find out there was no Santa Claus, dude. I'm going to be honest with you. But, you know, you, you know when, you watch, when you watch, you know, wrestling at that time, and, and I just remember that they – were trying that was the era that was kind of like when you were like michael jordan for example i'm a huge basketball fan so i know you, and if you i know you know who michael jordan is so i know you know who i'm talking about when you when you actually watch when you watch michael jordan and it's kind of like everything is just flowing that night it's like that season or that season or those playoff series where everything is just rolling it seems like every shot's going in everything's just rolling him and his teammates are flowing well they're winning games everything is flowing it's kind of like the same thing with the attitude there everything they had some misses but everything was really hitting and it was a time where everybody it was like that that hogan kid that was watching warrior that was six years old is now 18 19 years old you know what i'm saying a lot it, it, it was a lot of it changed and it, it, it transfers from the kids to the adults, and that made the adults extremely happy. And seeing Stone Cold's character, The Rock's character, guys didn't really care. Um, 
Ed, you actually believe these guys really didn't like each other, which I totally agree with you. These guys actually didn't. You could actually look at them and tell. Like the Rock and Triple H, you could tell there was not like – they didn't hate each other, but you could tell by the way they were fighting. It was like really some, some serious competition. Like those two guys are really competitive. Just by the way they were doing moves and how serious they took it, you could really tell. Nowadays with wrestling, man, these guys are buddies. Everybody's cool. Everybody travels together. Everybody, You know what I'm saying? Everybody's all, everybody's all funny. Everybody's family's all hanging out. And you can just tell some, in some of these matches nowadays, man, that some of these guys, it's just not the same. And um, I want to transfer it to one person, and I want to get your – Full opinion on this. I want to talk about John Cena for a minute because give me, in your opinion, from 04 at his rise when he was fighting for the U.S. title and things like that to now. Give me your opinion on on John Cena and and what has happened. What has happened with him? Do, I mean, do, first answer it as: Do you like him or do you not? And if you do or do not, give me the reasons why and what and what's happened to his character. No, I, I do like John Cena. I actually I like him a lot. I had the chance to interview him when we were down in Miami for WrestleMania a couple of years ago, and uh, we talked to him for a few minutes, and he was really cool, you know, very cool guy to hang out with. And I, I think what's happened is, is kind of obvious, is that when you're on top for so long, people start to resent you for it, and people start to get sick and tired of the same thing over and over again. And when you couple that with how his character is, his character is a character for the kids, right? Everything – is about positive, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having positive messages and, and positive reinforcement and all that kind of stuff. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But you have an audience, especially a young male audience, who gets tired after a while of seeing this guy come out wearing a baseball cap with a purple shirt or a pink shirt or you know his multicolored shirt that changes every other week, and it's the same stuff over and over again. Even Hogan, take Hogan for example. Hogan was one of the biggest stars of all time. Hogan, I mean, I, I became a wrestling fan because of Hulk Hogan. You can, you can make that argument. And what happened, if you look at the early 90s, like around 92, which we also talked about before, you started to see the tide turn a little bit against him. And that Royal Rumble, I, again, I just watched it again this morning, and I'm glad that the, the version of it they showed on demand was the unedited version because there's an edited version of the Royal Rumble from that year where when Hogan gets dumped out of the ring by Sid, they piped in booze for Sid. And they dubbed over the commentary to make it sound like, oh, you know, Sid, what a horrible person he is. He stabbed Hogan in the back. You know, meanwhile, the Royal Rumble match is every man for himself. He was well within his rights to do what he did. But the reason they did that is because the people cheered when Hogan got dumped out. And you look around in the crowd, people are jumping up and down. They love it because at that point they were tired of the same old shtick over and over again. And I think that's the biggest problem plaguing John Cena. He got pushed at a relatively young age probably younger than Hogan was when he got his first big push. Yeah. So Cena now is about 30, 35 years old. He's not an old man. He's getting older, but he's 35 years old. If he wanted to and he could stay healthy, conceivably, I mean, Cena could keep doing this for another 10 years. Can you imagine the backlash against him then if we have another 10 years of John Cena on top? That's just too long for one person, I think, to be in that spot when you have all these other talented guys who, who deserve a shot, and I spit the name Daniel Bryan out at you, I think if there's one guy on the current roster who, if, if you know, the worst thing happened tomorrow and John Cena got hit by a bus and he was laid up and he couldn't wrestle anymore, if there was one guy on the roster who I think fits the mold of what they would look for in a top baby face, Brian is as close to that as they have. You could plug him in there. I don't know that a guy like him or Punk is ever going to have that chance as long as Cena's on top. And I think that's, that's the biggest problem that you have with him. Yeah, man, and you know, and I, I want to defend Cena on something because this is what people have to understand, and you know, this is a motivational speaking positive show I do on Sundays, but I like to speak on things in life as well. Then I will do, I will dress up the life, um, the life, the life quotes in this. You know, there's nothing wrong, people. Let me just say this real quick, Solomon. So there's nothing wrong with positioning yourself to win. There is nothing wrong with that. You some people politic themselves in, in many ways to become you know to get themselves certain spots and it's the same thing in life as it is with business as long as you're not throwing nobody under the bus a lot of times to get your way to the top if you're gonna do something to keep yourself at a certain spot you worked hard for there's nothing wrong with it what happens is though when it, and let me transfer this to WWE when you put yourself in a situation where you have 
thousands of people each and every night, and you're not getting the response. It's kind of like how WWE will make it, oh, he's so controversial. He's There's nothing controversial about the dude. It's just the fact that everybody knows that they're tired of seeing the same guy there. He's the cash cow. He's bringing in all the money. He grants all the wishes. He makes all the kids happy. A lot of the kids right now are a lot of the genesis of what's um, making their parents buy tickets to go every night. It's funny because the, the adults are Daniel Bryan fans and their kids are John Cena fans. But their kids, when Daniel Bryan's come out, is doing the yes chant along with the parents. So it's crazy how it, 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 it's going on and how this is happening. But let me just say yeah. this from my personal opinion. I have no issues with John Cena. I don't have no issues with him as a wrestler. I just think that, you know, they just need they need to give the guy one thing that – he doesn't have to change his character. Turn him heel, turn him heel. I think it's kind of I, – I, in my opinion, you might disagree with me. I think it's kind of late. It might If you're going to turn him heel, it might be best to do it against Daniel Bryan now. But if, you know, if I think personally, man, I think that they need to give the guy some new opponents, man, because that's the thing that's really – killing him is the fact that he's beating the same guys. How many times are you going to see this guy fight Alberto Del Rio, bro? How many times is he, is Damian Sandow going to give him a good match and he's just going to beat him? How many times... Well, here, is, oh, go ahead, man. Go ahead. Well, here's, 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 here's the problem. Here's the problem with that. And, and this is not necessarily a problem with Cena. This may be a problem with, with WWE. When they do give him new opponents, and I, I throw Dolph Ziggler out to you as an example, he was somebody fresh who had never made a event at a pay-per-view before, and he did the pay-per-view last year, not last year now, I guess it was two years ago, the uh, the TLC pay-per-view, which was here in Brooklyn, and they did the TLC ladder match with him and, and Ziggler. Ziggler went over. It was one of the crowning moments of his career. And we see where Dolph Ziggler is now, and so the problem is when they do put Cena in there with new guys, you can, I mean, you could, you could use Daniel Bryan as an example. I think Bryan's doing just fine. Some would say that after SummerSlam, it was all downhill for him. They don't capitalize. When you beat John Cena, and, and Bryan beat him clean in the middle of the ring, no interference, no barn objects or anything like that, it's, it's amazing to me that you would squander that opportunity. If you have somebody who beats John Cena the way that Bryan did, I mean, that person should be way up here. And instead, they've taken people like Ziggler and, I mean, Damian Sandow didn't beat Cena, but when they had their match on, uh, on Raw last year, the Money in the Bank cash, it was one of Sandow's most memorable matches, and they could have done something with him at that point, even though he lost, and they did nothing with him. And they just had another match recently, and, again, a very good showing for Damian Sandow. Do I have any faith at all that they're going to capitalize on that and that Sandow is going to be doing something meaningful? Of course not. So – even when they put fresh new guys in there with Cena, nothing comes from it. And that's yeah. not John Cena's fault. That's Vince McMahon's fault because they need to take from that. You know, they, they need to use that as an opportunity to push these new guys to the next level, and they don't do that. So I'm not even sure what that accomplishes when you put new people in there with Cena. And even if Cena loses, in the end, Cena really wins, and nothing ever changes, and that's the problem. You you know what man that's a very great point and um you know I think another thing that has to go with it too man which uh, I feel like you agree with me on is that in Hogan's era Hogan barely lost and you know he he you know it was always something to make him lose it was always some reason it was always some reason but the key but the key let me let, let me let me butt in here though the key about that though is you're right it was a very rare thing when Hogan lost and you mentioned the Warrior match Warrior beat him clean in the middle of the ring and what did they do. They decided right. to push Warrior as their new head guy. Now, it didn't work out. They felt business wasn't booming the way they had thought it would, and they ended up putting the belt right back on Hogan, but they gave him a chance. Warrior had the right. title for almost a full year before they took it off him, and, and so at least back then they did take a chance on somebody new. Right, right. And I was just about to say that. You just made my point. The thing is you have to. Business, see, the, the attitude there was built off risk. It was a huge risk. We didn't know what Stone Cold was going to be. We didn't know if the Mr. McMahon character was actually going to work. We didn't know if the Rock's jokes was going to get over. We didn't know if Triple H was going to be the guy that worked with the guy to help get him over. We didn't know that, man. But we didn't know that Vince was giving it a shot. And I think right now with the network and everything coming out, I think they're trying to be very safe, which is causing a lot of issues. Now, what I will say, issues with the fans, excuse me. What I will say about this is, you know, you have a guy like Daniel Bryan who is undisputedly, which is most people, I'm just joining the club here, he's the most exciting guy. I love watching Daniel Bryan on television. I love 
watching Daniel Bryan and his work. The guy is natural. And I want to say, I want to ask you this, man. What do you think, it, how organic was it that fans started getting behind this guy? Why do you think people got behind Daniel Bryan the way they did? I just think he has a likable personality, and I think it's it's also people who respect his work. He's just very, very good at what he does in the ring, and so that's a big part of it. And he's just, I think he's a likable character. He can play the comedy role if you want him to do comedy. He was really funny. The team held no stuff with him and Kane. You want him to be serious. He's like a little bulldog in there, and and he can ratchet up the intensity. He can, you know, he'll be flying around the ring like a madman. So I think people appreciate that. I think they appreciate the the effort that he puts in, and you put those two things together, and it's it's no wonder that people have taken to him. And also part of it is, and this is kind of funny. I bring this up. I was at that WrestleMania in Miami, and that was when he lost the world title to Sheamus in 18 seconds. And I could tell you, myself included, there were a lot of very upset people. Uh, when that happened, because we just felt like Sheamus and Brian were both shortchanged on that show. A lot of people were looking forward to the match, but it didn't do Brian justice. And looking back on it, it may have been the best thing that ever happened to him. And I, I only give WWE a little bit of credit for it because I don't think this is their intent. It just kind of happened that way. But it may have been the best thing that ever happened to him because there were so many people who I think felt so badly for this guy and they felt so angry about what had happened in the building on Raw the next night, and I, I could feel it because I was there, people just went crazy for him. That was the beginning of the yes phenomenon, and it just it just went from there. It, it just snowballed from there. And you could say that a big part of why he's so popular is resentment, resentment of how the company treated him at that WrestleMania. And in the end, it, it kind of worked to his benefit because look where Sheamus is and look where Brian is right now. Yeah, man. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely right, man. I, are you a Sheamus fan? I I don't hate Sheamus. I I'm not a huge Sheamus fan. He just doesn't do much for me. I don't hate the guy, but I I would not call myself a big fan of Sheamus now. I, I that's okay. Let me he's give a you good my worker. He, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let he's me good. Say this though, he he's a good worker, and and him and Brian had some of the best matches in WWE back in 2012. I would not mind a Brian Sheamus feud at some point down the road. Not right now, because I think Brian should be doing, you know, better things than that. But when Sheamus eventually comes back, and I've pitched this on my show before, he should come back as a heel, and at some point, and I wouldn't mind if this even turned into a, a WWE title feud down the road, I wouldn't mind seeing the two of them put back together, because they work, they work very well together. His work in the ring, I think Sheamus is really good. Just in terms of his character, he's, uh, <laughs> last we saw of him, he was, he was kind of a bully. And I, I'm not quite sure. He was he was one of the more awkward baby faces, I think, in the company. He wasn't pushed at this likable personality. Maybe that's part of the reason why I'm not so enamored with Sheamus as a character. Yeah, man, you know, I, I'm just not sold. I've never been sold. When he comes out and I hear his music, which I can't stand his theme music. I can't stand it. And when he comes out and when he makes and when he makes his entrance, I just don't – I just – if he him being on the show to me right now has, has I haven't missed anything. I'm just being honest with you. So I I'm not really a Sheamus fan. I'm not a Del Rio fan. I I just think I can't stand him either. I just don't know why. They just don't stick with me. I don't like either one of those guys. But um, let's go into character, man. Character nowadays. What do you think is missing from characters in the business nowadays? I know there's a lot of lame guys out there. What do you think is missing? Like as far as characters, because I know Daniel Bryan is an authentic character. Bray Wyatt's authentic. Um, there's a lot of guys who has really incomplete packaging, man. I don't know who they are. Can you agree with that? Yeah, I mean, in terms of what's missing, if you want to go back to the Warrior talk from before, drugs, lots of drugs. I think that's part <laughs> of the reason why those characters were so out of their minds back in the day. And, and I, when I say that on my show, I'm kind of I'm only part joking because I'm sure a big part of, of those promos and, and the guys that they were presented on TV, the way they, they the reason they were like that was because of all the stuff they were doing back then. But besides the drugs, I think uh, probably it just has to do with how, I don't, I don't know if homogenized is the right word. Everything now just seems so rehearsed. And everything seems, everything has to be all prim and proper. And we go to commercial break. You, you can almost call it to the second, you know, when they go to commercial break on TV. Uh, I can call it in my head. Everything just is so uh, in this, in this, machine and it just goes and it's it's the same formula over and over again and i hate that 
I have to say, I just I don't like that style of wrestling. And even if you go back to 97, 98, just before the Attitude Era, there was a certain unpredictability about the show. You never knew what was going to happen next. And it didn't feel so, so, so like, a, like a Broadway show or like a movie. And I think that's how Vince McMahon likes it, because he's made that comment before about, oh, you know, we make movies. Well, not really. You don't really make movies. And I wish that they would get away from that a little bit. And, for example, in terms of promos, if you let these guys go out there, and, and some guys do. I'm sure a guy like Triple H, when he goes out there, is not you know remembering in his head, okay, what was the next word in this script? He probably goes out there with a sense of what he's got to say, and he says it. But a lot of the guys I'm willing to bet, mid-card guys and all that, either don't get a chance to cut promos, or when they do, instead of cutting a promo, they're trying to remember their lines. And I can't connect with that. When I look at a guy on camera backstage being interviewed, and he's looking off to the side, all I could think in my head is, what is this guy looking at? Is he reading cue cards? Is he looking at a hot girl who just walked by? Like, why isn't he looking at me? Why isn't he looking directly in the camera? And these are basic things like promos where Mean Gene back in the day would stand there with a mic in his hand and you had one static camera view. The camera did, you know, wasn't some guy with a handheld camera swaying back and forth. Basic stuff like that can make the difference. And we don't have that now. Everything is rush, rush, rush. We have to get our segments in. If somebody has a chance to talk, you know, 15 seconds and you're done. And it, it really hurts the enjoyment, I think, of, of the product. You know, you make you, – and let me add to that because you're, you're absolutely right. Let me speak as a wrestling fan, just as a fan. If the WWE ever listens to this show, if anybody ever listens to this show from the WWE, it's just so happened you click on this. Let me tell you something that I don't understand, and I'm going to add to this. Dolph Ziggler, for example. Okay, you're a show-off. What are you showing off? I don't know what you're showing off. You know what I'm saying? I don't. You're not. You. You know. I, I no. No dude is gonna buy a pink shirt. No dude is gonna sit there and watch you come out and moving your hips around when I'm no. I don't want to see that. And you're going out there and you're saying you're a show off, but I don't understand what your character is. Yes, you're a show off. Do you show off when you get your ass whooped? You're a show off because you can do all these flips. I don't know. I don't know your character. Biggie Langston, for example. I'm a huge Big E fan. I love him, but. I don't know why didn't he come from NXT with the, with the I need five gimmick. You say you need three, you need five, but now he's in WWE. His music saying he doesn't need three, he needs five, and I don't understand what he needs five of now. You know, they, 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 they drop the ball on a lot of these things because he comes out and he has no, the five count has nothing to do with his character. He, does, he barely gets a microphone, and when he does, it, you know, they barely let him say much. He says a little bit. And a lot of these guys, man, they're incomplete. I just don't, I don't understand it. Like it's like with Del Rio now. What is his character? Are you the rich guy that comes out in the limousine no more? No, you're not. I don't know what you are anymore. So it kind of makes me, you know, I end up getting a little lost, man, in their characters. And um, oh, okay, just um, letting everybody know. Um, we had a little technical difficulty. Salamonster called, has dropped. Just looking, but he will call back. Let me explain my thought process right now as I'm going on. He will call back. Sorry for technical difficulties, you guys. He will be back on. Um, I don't understand why a lot of these guys in, the, in this business are uh, completely un, unpackaged in a very bad way. I don't understand Biggie Langston's character. I don't understand Dolph Ziggler's character. I don't understand a lot of these guys and their character and who they are. You know, let me let me make something very clear to you guys. I've been a wrestling fan for my recollection since 1992. I've been watching. I'm 26 years old. I've been watching wrestling for a long time, and I can go back from the beginning. To now, and I can actually see the holes that the business has made. For example, um, let me speak on part-time wrestlers that are coming into business right now. There's a lot of gripe on, you know, um, we don't want a lot of part-time guys in the business. We don't want a, we want a lot of part-time guys coming into business. The Batistas, the Brock Lesnar, the Rocks. Well, let me give you an explanation. If guys that you're pushing aren't getting a reaction now, why should why shouldn't these guys come back and get an opportunity? These guys get an automatic reaction when they come out. So Solomon, are you back on, bro? I I'm here. I don't know what uh, what happened there, but I'm on my phone now. So uh, hopefully that won't happen again. I got you, man. It is all good. I let everybody know. And PSA, it's all good, man. So let me ask you this. I was just speaking about part time part time wrestlers in the WWE, man. What do you? What is? A lot of people have a lot of gripes with 
you know, with um with the part time wrestlers coming back. This is my thing, man, and I know you agree with me on this. Is not only that, but these guys get automatic reactions, and maybe, just maybe, just maybe, you guys need to think about this. You guys in the back that are mad that these part time guys are coming back. Maybe if y'all came out and got a reaction, maybe these guys wouldn't have to come back. But a lot of you dudes that are coming out there, the fans are have they they not they're not they don't care if you come out. So when you come out and you're actually trying to wrestle your match and the crowd is quiet and you see a guy like Batista, Brock Lesnar, The Rock comes back and then the crowd goes crazy. That's the reason you don't you don't you know a lot of these guys they, you can get pushed to the moon. Oh, you need to push this guy. They need to push this guy. They need to push that guy. Fine, you can push him, but if they don't get a reaction, nobody cares. They don't get booed or cheered. The crowd's just quiet. I can't tell you how many times I see guys come out solid monster and they might get pushed and they're not getting a reaction. So what is your opinion? What is your opinion about the the part time guys coming back? I don't mind the part time guys coming back if if they're used you know in, in in the right way and that's going to be different depending on the person. I'll use Brock Lesnar as an example. I've made no bones about the fact on my show. I love Brock Lesnar. And to go back to the point you were making before about, you know, what's your character? I don't know who you are. I don't know what you're all about. With Brock Lesnar, there is no debate about who he is and what he's all about. Brock Lesnar right. shows up. Brock Lesnar beats you up. And Brock Lesnar gets paid and goes home. That's it. That's his motivation. His motivation is beating people up and making money. And it's very easy. You don't, you know, it's not complicated. You're not wondering, okay, what's this guy all about? And he's very good at what he does. He's very believable. He brings an element of realism into things that I think we don't get with hardly anybody, really, on the main roster. That's what makes him an attraction. So a guy like Brock coming back, even if it's just twice a year, three times a year, whether he wins or he loses, and I would, I would actually prefer he win more. It would mean more if I think he didn't lose as much as he did in, in the past. But I love a guy like Brock. Batista, we'll see. You know, Batista is going to be back on television tonight. He'll be in the Royal Rumble. There's a lot of rumors that he may win. He's going to get the title match at WrestleMania. I'm not enamored with that idea. Uh, I didn't mind it. I didn't mind it when they did that with The Rock because I thought it made sense. And The Rock is – there is no – are as big as The Rock, you know, amongst all these guys. I think we can pretty much agree on that. So yep. I know why they did it, and I was cool with it. With the, I feel like with, with Brian and with Punk and with some of the guys they have, it would make more sense to get those guys in the main event, in the main event picture, and and just put Batista in a different match, not not a championship match. I, I just It's hard for me, and I know some, some people will get tired of me talking about Daniel Bryan. I, I get some hate comments and hate mail. All you do is talk about Daniel Bryan. You know, he's not, what's so great about this guy? For, forget about that for a second. I can't believe that they would start the story they did with him last summer. Thank and we you. all saw what happened, and we all saw the way he was booked. Well, here we are heading into WrestleMania season, and I just I don't see how it makes any sense at all not to finish that story. And the only way for that story to end is for him to stand triumphant in the end over the authority. And it makes sense for him to do that with the title. So the idea that Batista may be in that spot instead of a guy like Brian, when the story would make more sense with Brian, that's what bothers me. That's why I would much rather see a Brock Brian match. You know, we're talking about part time guys. I don't mind Brock being in the main event if he's going in there to defend against a guy like Brian or Punk or whoever. Uh, but the idea of Batista, you know, going to the main event, winning the title, I, I'm not really a, a big fan of that idea. So it, it depends based on the part-timer on who they are. Yeah, man. And one thing I want to say, I know it's not going to happen uh, unless his run is very extended. For these, I think he signed a two-year contract, correct? Um, I believe so, you know, yes. Batista, if you sign a two-year contract, please, please, on God's green earth, please. Batista, in these two years, please do that heel turn one more time. It might not be the same. But just do that last heel turn when you was on your way out because it was some of the most enjoyable TV I've ever watched watching somebody turn heel in a short period of time. My, my my guys who turned heel for a short period of time and I loved was him and when The Rock did the Hollywood character. I loved those because they were so entertaining, and you could tell they didn't care. They were going off script. They didn't care. So 
I really love those. Uh, the Batista, when he's a face, it was cool, but he gets bland kind of fast. You know, the fireworks and all that. It gets, eh, gets kind of bland. I liked it when he came out and the, and, the, and the arena got dark and the spotlight was just on him and he was walking. It was some of the most entertaining, one of the most entertaining times to me. So let me ask you this, man. As WrestleMania comes up, you know, I asked uh, another guest who was on the show previously, um, we were talking wrestling about this. If you had to put The Undertaker in a match, you had to put Daniel Bryan in a match, and you had to put John Cena in a match, which guys would you have them face? Well, I mean, there, there's a whole bunch of different possibilities that you can uh, that you can explore. I think, you know, I think my ideal card right now as it's been, I just did a whole, I just did a whole column. Uh, on Layfield Report, because I, I have a writing gig on JBL's website. I did a whole column about Brock Lesnar and Daniel Bryan as your WrestleMania main event for the title. I like the idea of that match. I like, you know, the David versus Goliath story and all that. So I think I would probably go with Brock Bryan instead of Brock Undertaker. Undertaker and John Cena is another match I've been talking about for years. I, I'm almost shocked they haven't already done it. And I think if they want to hold off on it for Undertaker's final match, I'm okay with that as long as they do it. I think there's big money in a Cena Undertaker match, and I think in some ways Cena's the biggest opponent left for the Undertaker. Yeah. Um, but if they're not going to do it this year, the the alternate idea that I just came up with, there's been a lot of rumors about Sting. Is Sting going to come over to WWE? I, personally, I don't think it's happening. I think he's sticking with TNA. I think it, if it was going to happen, it would have happened by now. But let's say hypothetically he does come over, and, and it looks like there's a 50-50 chance it could happen. Everyone is, is just going crazy about, oh, finally, you know, Undertaker against Sting. I, you know, I think it's too late. I think it's too late to do that Thank match, and I don't think it's going to be Thank very good. But Thank I think you. what you can do, and I think what would get people really excited, because I don't think people want to boost Sting, what I would do is bring him in, if he's ready to come over, and do a tag match where Undertaker and Sting are allies. They're partners in a match against the Shield. It would be a huge high profile match for the shield which they deserve. I love the shield. I am going to I'm going to cry and be sad the day they break up because <laughs> they're so awesome together, but I think they're going to be even better when they go their separate ways. But they, you know, they they deserve to be in a high profile position when Mania rolls around and that that would be a huge match for them. So story-wise it makes sense and you know, star power-wise I think that would be a big match as well. So where that leaves Cena, that that's really the question. Uh, if Cena's not in the title match, what do you do with him? Uh, you know, look, wherever Cena's going to end up, I'm sure it'll be a big match. There were rumors of Cena and Bray Wyatt. To me, that doesn't really sound like a WrestleMania-worthy match. Me so maybe I would see, you know, maybe Cena, Orton, and Batista. You know, I'm not a fan of triple threats in the main event, but if it's not the main event, then I'm fine with it. Maybe you put those three in a match together for the number one contender spot. Whoever wins gets the title match against Brian after WrestleMania because you know Brock's not going to stick around. Uh, yeah. That might be the way to go. So I think maybe, you know, maybe that would be my my card for for Mania this year. You know, I, um, you know, talking about the business, man, and talking about wrestling and looking at the business in general and seeing where it's going. You see a guy like Daniel Bryan, you see a guy like John Cena, and you see where the company's trying to go with this. There's, this is one of the WrestleManias where they have many avenues. Let me just comment on the Undertaker and Sting thing, because I have a very unpopular opinion with this. Everybody's looking at Sting like it's 1998. It's not, man. It's, it's, this, is not, this is not the matchup I want to see for the simple fact is that at this point now, you kind of need somebody that can help carry The Undertaker slightly. Not all the match, but physically somebody who can move around. CM Punk, Triple A, Shawn Michaels. Somebody who, Undertaker can still move, but somebody who can do a lot for his offense. And Sting can't do that. Sting can barely do the Scorpion Deathlock anymore. So, it would be very hard. It would be very hard for me to watch that match. I don't think the match would be that good. I think it would be a lot of rest spots. I don't think it'd be everything everybody is saying that it would be, so I wouldn't want that at WrestleMania. Like, a tag match, that is a very great idea. I think, um, in a nutshell, I don't think that WWE is really making me angry about, man, right now. Like you said, is their lack of story of storyline flow, man. You had Big Show crying on TV, Stephanie McMahon slapping him all over the place. Then the angle just dropped. Then he's teaming with Rey Mysterio. You know, what is your opinion, man, of bad booking? Let me give you – if I had to ask you – okay, Solid Monster – Give me an instant of, you can say past or now, 
What is bad booking? What would you say? An example. <laughs> I'll give you three initials, WCW. <laughs> I'll give you two, I'll give you three more initials TNA. Uh, and now we gotta, we we gotta be we gotta be fair though. We can also say WWE, uh, and we've seen a lot of it actually over the last few months. Uh, I'll yeah. give you I'll give you a more recent example. How about Dolph Ziggler? You know, Dolph Ziggler is a young guy. Dolph Ziggler is a guy who had a fan following, who is a great athlete, and I think could be. I, you know, I, I don't see him as being the top guy the way that Cena or even Brian is, but I think he could be way up there. Yeah. And finally, after all this time, they, they gave him the ball. I was in the building when he won the world title last year. It was, it was unbelievable. I mean, you could feel the building shaking. And granted, it was, you know, the international fans were there. It was New York and New Jersey. Maybe he wouldn't get that reaction in, uh, in Kentucky somewhere. But, you know, he was very popular, and they put the belt on him. And he got hurt. He got his first concussion. He's uh, still recovering from, from the second one. But he got hurt. He was gone for a while, came back, and it's almost like they lost interest in him or, or they were punishing him for, for getting hurt. And I'm sure they had their reasons. Yeah, he could be – you listen to him in interviews. I think he's probably shot his mouth off a few times too many and rubbed people the wrong way. But to let petty things like that get in the way, when you have a guy with that much talent who's very, very good at what he does and has a fan following and have the world title – and to go from being the world heavyweight champion to losing matches to Curtis Axel on main event, no offense to Curtis Axel, that, that's what I call bad booking right there. Uh, you know, because I worry, you know, we're going to turn around if he's still with the company in three, four, or five years, and Ziggler's going to be in his mid-30s, and we're going to say to ourselves, you know, he's past his prime, and boy, you know, they could have really done something with this guy, but they never did. And you could come up with ten different people that you could say the same thing for. I know I have friends who are big fans of Kofi Kingston. I think Kofi's great, but I know people who are huge Kofi Kingston marks. And you could use him as another example. Go back a few years. It looked like maybe they were going to do something with him, him and Randy Orton. And then he got squashed, and it didn't go anywhere. So I, I could sit here all day and, and give you names of – you know, mid-card guys who could have been something and were on their way, and because of bad booking or politics or whatever, uh, or maybe because of their own fault, but they didn't go anywhere, and and that stinks. Yeah, man, I, I'd have to say my guy, who I'm a huge fan of. I'm a, I'm a big Big E fan. I'm a big Doll fan. Uh, I honestly think um, Fandango well, might. Well, well, just let me let me just uh, sorry to right, interrupt, right. but just oh, to, ahead, uh, since you mentioned Big E and I just mentioned Dolph. Another great example, you know, Biggie and Dolph were together. They were very entertaining, them and AJ. I thought they made a good little triple threat group there. Right. And, you know, Ziggler turned, whatever happened, they split them up. And they could have done something between Biggie and Dolph, but it looked like they were kind of going in that direction. I mean, they, they split up, right? It would make sense to actually put them together in a feud or a match on pay-per-view. And maybe there was one match. I don't even remember. But, they ended it. They ended it prematurely, and it's just like they dropped whatever plans they had, and nothing ever happened between the two of them. And, and there have been times where, you know, the two of them were in some, you know, wacky WWE app poll on Raw, and you see the two of them standing next to each other on TV like nothing ever happened. These guys used to be best buds, and they broke up, and it's just completely forgotten. So when they forget about their own storylines, it's insulting to the fans. Because the fans actually care about this. I know they don't. I know it's just wrestling, and that's probably how they rationalize. It's just wrestling. Who cares? The problem with that notion is that when we watch, we want to believe. You know, we want to believe that the stuff we're watching actually means something. And when they just completely disregard their own stories, it's insulting to the audience. So I think that goes to what you're, you're talking about. Exactly, man. And one thing I want to make very clear, how somebody always asks me, you know, Antoine, um, how could the WWE get better in your opinion? How could the WWE get better? Well, for one, you can follow through on storylines. Two, you can give guys an opportunity to actually be friends with each other. People have to understand that back in the days when you had Hogan, when you had Hitman, you know, even though guys were singles, back in the day, Hogan would be like, well, well, brother, I got my good friend the tugboat here, and he's going to – and it kind of helped that guy too. When he, when the top guy had a friend, he had the big boss man, or he had, you know, he'd bring out yeah, – Hogan, uh, <laughs> Hogan had a lot of weird friends. Let me just say that, you know, Hogan <laughs> would come out with Brutus Beefcake. <laughs> 
who had rips. That, you know, he looked like something you would find on 42nd Street in New York about 20 years ago, and that was kind of weird. And then Hogan became friends with Tugboat, who walked around with the sailor hat on his head going, boop, boop. And I just thought to myself, boy, you know, I'm a Hulk Hogan fan, but who, who is this guy hanging out with? He's got a lot of really weird friends. I just remember thinking that back in the day. Really weird friends. You want you and John Cena to get an emotional reaction. Why don't you have a guy? Why don't you have a guy? Another thing they could do as well. I mean, before I say that with John Cena, why don't you have feuds actually last a long time and be entertaining? We all saw what the Daniel Bryan and Randy Orton feud. After a while, eh. But let let a few actually have a story, let it build up, and let it have a climax, let it finish. Let guys have friends. You want to do you want to do natural traditional booking? Well, how about this for some advice? How about you give John Cena a friend, a great friend? You know, how about this? Make Zach make <laughs> Zach Ryder make Zach Ryder. You know, how about have Zach well, Ryder be his best friend in the world, best friend in the world, and maybe he maybe he turns on him and it makes a good. Well, here, here here's the thing. I was actually you mentioned Zach Ryder. I was going to bring that up. That might not be the best idea. They, they actually <laughs> they did that already. If you remember, if you go back two yeah. years. Zack yeah. Ryder was on TV when he was getting something of a push, and he was he was acknowledged on TV as being good friends with John Cena. John Cena would wear his you know woo 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 headband, and he would do the whole gimmick thing. And uh, unfortunately for for Zack, it kind of <laughs> blew up in his face because if you remember the story they did, John Cena was such a wonderful friend to Zack Ryder that Zack found him kissing Eve, who was his his dear you know, his love interest. And uh, I think at the end of that storyline, Zack Ryder ended up in a body cast, I believe. He was in a wheelchair thrown off a stage. Might not be the best idea to be friends with John Cena on TV. Very great point because obviously, you know, um, we see how that we see how that happens. And um, who was that guy recently? Friends like that, that, you know, with friends like that, I'd rather be alone. Who who was who was that guy that actually came out not too long ago and had a feud with John Cena? Oh, Ryback. Well, he was um where Ryback would come help John, and then John would never come help Ryback, something like that. And then that's what was starting a little bit of the heel turn for Ryback. But you know, let's go let's go into something. Let's go into the plugs, man. How did you come up with the idea to start your own podcast? Let's get to the plug in. Let's get to your show. How did you start the idea to start Solid Monster Sounds off? What what was the basis of it? The basis of it was a friend of mine was running a wrestling news website and was thinking of ideas for, you know, original content. I mean, you can you can only do so much when you're just kind of running wrestling news and not much else. So I think, I don't remember if it was him or me, I think I pitched the idea, well, why don't I do an audio show? And it wasn't intended to be some full-blown weekly podcast. I just figured, why don't, you know, I take a few minutes each week to do uh, an audio show and talk about what happened on Raw that week and that's how it started and then I kept doing it you know week after week and I started incorporating other news into the show it was always mostly WWE but I would talk about a little bit of ROH a little bit of TNA and it just went from there there was no big grand master plan or anything like that it just that that's how it started and it just grew and it grew and it grew and I already had the built-in audience through his website which which was very helpful to me because a lot of people start shows with, with, you know, they go on YouTube or they go on one of these websites where you can upload podcasts, but how do you get people to listen? So I already had a, an audience like that built in. People like what they heard. Word spreads. And, and here we are six years later. I'm still doing the show. Six years, man. So, you know, as as a radio personality to another personality, man, you know, I do motivational speaking. I do wrestling shows. If you had to sit down and and give somebody advice, and you could be talking to me or you could be talking to anybody, man. If somebody said, hey, man, I want to do a podcast and I want to talk about whatever or even wrestling or whatever, what advice would you give them if they wanted to start their own podcast, if they're doing podcasts now? What advice would you give somebody? What's the most important thing you could tell them doing radio? Uh, I get emails like this all the time, and I, I tell everybody the same thing. The best advice that I can give is just to be passionate about whatever you're talking about. So if you're a wrestling fan, be passionate about wrestling. If you're a baseball fan, be passionate about that. I think people, they like the idea of having their own show with a big audience and having lots of friends on Facebook and Twitter followers, and that's that's fine. You know, that that, that will come in time, but you have to actually have a knowledge of what you're talking about and actually like it. And there are times, believe me, when I don't like wrestling so much. There are weeks like that as well. And, and some people tell me those are the best sound offs. Uh, but you just have to have a passion for what you're talking about. And people say to me, well, you know, you've been doing your show for so long, and how would you build up an audience? I built up an audience because 
at first I wasn't very good. And as I kept doing it, I got better at it. I found my voice. I go back and listen to those early sound offs I did in 07, and I put them up on my YouTube channel. I don't know why, but I did. And I, I can't even, like, get through that first show, the first, like, one or two shows. I mean, they're not terrible, but I listen to those shows, and it's, like, a completely different person because it took me a while to actually feel comfortable in my own voice to develop a format for the show. At first, I didn't know what I was doing. After a while, I, I said, okay, well, we'll talk about this show. We'll do a mailbag, and, you know, we'll incorporate other elements into the show. You just have to be patient. You have to have passion and patience. Those are the two key things that I that I tell people. Yeah, man, and um, I get this as well. Uh, I get this question a lot. I've had a lot of my, my, my friends who have hit me up, hey, man, you've had celebrities on the show. You're doing this. You're doing that. Man, I want to start my very own radio show, too. I want to get the celebrities. Give me some advice. I said, man, you know. Listen, man, I'm not going to tell anybody not to do anything. I'm, I'm a positive person. I, obviously, this is a mo- basis of this is motivational speaking. I'm not going to tell anybody not to do anything, but don't just don't do it to follow what somebody else is doing. If you want to do it because you feel like you can do it, then be passionate about it. Love it. Recognize that. Recognize your voice. On try try um try not to have anything. Try not to have uh, blank spots where you don't know what you're talking about. Know what you're talking about. Be passionate of what you're talking about. If you're listening to the show and you actually want to start the podcast, he gave great advice. And my advice to you guys as well is also understand understand who you are on radio. You know, some people are naturally gossip people, man. So if that's what they want to do. Hey, have a show about that. Understand who you are. Have fun with it. And like like Solomon just said, man, have a lot of patience and really take your time and understand that the guests take everything that the guests say when they listen to the show. Take everything that the guests say and and consider it, and it'll make your show better. Um, let's go to the Layfield Report, man. How'd you get started with uh, doing calls for the Layfield Report? Well, they were they were looking for bloggers at the beginning of the year last year, and, and JBL I noticed was posting some stuff online and. I I wasn't made aware of it until later on. I thought I had missed the cutoff, and I I think what happened is he was more active on his uh, Facebook page at the time, and I just made a post, and I said, oh, you know, I I can't believe I missed this. Well, you know, whatever. If you're still looking for people, I'd be interested to contribute a column, and I just left it alone. And he responded right away and said, oh, we'd love to have you write for the website. What would you have in mind? And it it just went from there. So, you know, it was never any doubt I was going to do a wrestling column, but I mean, you could find a lot of other types of news on that website. I think they're trying to create what they've done with with Layfield Report is they've tried to create something very similar to what you would find on, on you know Drudge Report or a lot of these aggregate news sites where it brings all the news of the day in one place. So in theory, you don't have to go anywhere else; you can just go there. Uh, so you have the blogs like the one I do, but they actually have news articles and they have their own podcasts. So it just started that way. I, I said, listen, I'd love to do a column about this and maybe talk a little bit about wrestling history every now and then besides current events. Started doing the blogs, and I've been doing it now for over a year. Wow, man. Um, you know, so let's go backstage, man. Let's go backstage. And has, has anybody that you've, you know, you said you met John Cena. What wrestlers have you actually met, man, and uh, good experiences meeting uh, these guys or, or women? Who have you actually met before? Yeah, I mean, I've I met a ton of people. I mean, if you want to go back to even when I was younger, I, I met Vince McMahon. You know, I got a funny picture of my, my one and only meeting with him up on my Facebook page, which was back in uh, in 94 when they had the very first Fan Fest. Now it's Fan Access. Uh, but there's Vince and his, I mean, the, the suits that he would wear back in the day were something else. And uh, this pastel with the, you know, block letter WWF logo on it. So I got to meet him, and I got to meet Shawn Michaels uh, several different times. I met The Rock once when he was here in, in my neck of the woods in Brooklyn. Uh, but when I met Cena, this was a couple of years ago as part of WrestleMania, a good friend of mine uh, is, is in radio, and that's kind of how that whole thing came about through his connection. And we had a chance to sit down, bright, bright-eyed and bushy-tailed at 6.30 in the morning. We're sitting in Radio Row at the convention center in uh, in Miami, and the first person who comes walking over to us is Daniel Bryan. And he was the world champion at the time. This, again, was two days before he lost in 18 seconds. But he sits down and, and literally just, you know, not even five feet in front of us. We're not even prepared. You know, we, we, we go into that thinking, okay, it's 6.30 in the morning. We're new here. We'll be lucky. Maybe we'll get David Otunga. Maybe we'll get Kurt Hawkins. 
you know, th- th- those kind of people, all of a sudden Daniel <laughs> Bryan comes walking over and, you know, they start panicking. Oh, you know, we didn't prepare for this. It's like, well, what do you need to prepare for? You know, I, I've got a million questions swimming around in my head. We met him. He was, he was, he was great. You know, he's just a really cool laid back person. Uh, Kelly Kelly, we met, you know, Kofi. Um, to me, the big thrill, though, in Miami that year, besides, you know, interviewing Brian and Cena and all them, uh, we got to sit face-to-face and interview uh, Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard, right, the four horsemen, brain busters, call them what you will, uh, wow. who who weren't even together for a number of years. Tully Blanchard was pretty much out of wrestling. So the idea that I'd be able to interview both of these guys together, sitting next to each other, is like, wow. As a longtime fan, it was it was actually really cool. Uh, Shawn Michaels, you know, came over, we interviewed him, Edge, uh, and just, it was, it was pretty, it was a pretty incredible experience. And my, my experiences with all of them were positive. I don't really have anything negative to say, uh, about anybody I ever met. Sid, uh, you know, they were always, they were always really nice to me. So I don't really have any, any horror stories. Even the story I told on the sound up this week about the, uh, warrior, at uh, at my university many years ago, he may not have been very nice to some of the other people that day, but to me, uh, he was class A. I got no complaints. Right, man, and I, I you know, I definitely want to um, say, you know, I've had the uh, the very, very great honor of meeting um, the great Jimmy Hart. I just met him last week. Like I said, I'm gonna be doing a live interview with him. I'd love for you to watch the video, man, and get your opinion on the interview that we'll do. And um, you know, to be able to get uh, a live interview with him, such a nice guy. And uh, met, I met X-Pop before at a club, no name, no blame. I was getting drunk, and I met him. And uh, this, was, this was right after that sex tape came out, and he was, like, kind of depressed. And I could tell, because he, you could tell he's got a lot on his mind. He was standing there by himself. We're in this big club. Well, if there was a sex tape that leaked and uh, it was you in China, I'd, I'd probably be depressed, too. Just, you yeah, know, not for nothing. yeah. Yeah, no, nah, not yeah, definitely. I definitely would be very upset too, especially. Yeah. But um, you know, we talk, you know, you you actually um um look over to your left and you're just sitting there and I'm sitting there drinking with my friends, me and a couple of my friends and uh the mother and my son we were dating at the time and and um I look over and he's just sitting there. And I'm like I'm like Xbox he looks up, he's like, hey, what's up, man? I'm like, what's up? And I'm like, what you doing, man? I'm sitting there having a basic conversation with him. And um, we're talking for a few minutes. And then I started asking him a few questions. And then I kind of left him alone. I was like, do you mind taking a picture? He says, sure. And I end up losing the picture like an idiot. But um, very, very, very nice guy. And uh, those are the only two people I've met. I hope, you know, there's the Hogan like a, there's a Hogan Beach here in Tampa. All those guys be here. And um, hopefully I get a chance to meet those guys. And Hopefully, me and you get to link up one day. I'm always, I'm always gonna end up going back to New York eventually because that's where 95 percent of my family is. So, it'd be good to link up, man, and talk wrestling one day. Cool, cool. No, this has been, uh, this has been fun. I can't believe we've been out for so long. This is, uh, this has been fun. Half talking. Uh, get before you off. Uh, check you out, my brother. Uh, well, people can uh, check me out on uh, on Twitter at Solomonster. Uh, I'm always on there. I'll probably be on there for Raw tonight talking about what will hopefully be a good show six days Me before too. the Rumble. Me uh, too. <laughs> I'm, all over, I'm all over Facebook, too. The, uh, the, you know, it's weird. When I started on Facebook many years ago, I, I didn't realize, you know, probably should have started as a, as a fan page. And instead I started as a, uh, a profile and, you know, built up all these friends. And then halfway through I said, ah, you know what? Probably should start a fan page. So we have a fan page. There's a profile page. There's a group page with almost a thousand people, and it's great. You know, one of the cool things about the show over the years that I really like is the fact that we've built up this little community. So whether it's on Facebook or or wherever, there's a group of people who listen to my show, but who probably speak to each other more than they speak to me. And it's almost independent of me at this point, and so that's really cool. So they're all over Facebook. And the show, you can just go to the com. They go up every week, typically on Sunday afternoons. Uh, they're not, they don't air live; they're recorded. But you can find all the episodes there, archived. All not all 300 shows, but a good portion of them are up there. And uh, and give us a listen. I think you may enjoy it. 
Definitely, man. I want to say, man, from the bottom of my heart, man, you're a big inspiration to me on um, on doing radio, period. Not only the topics, but how you sound, how, uh, you know, when you do radio, you hear little things and um, know when to raise your voice, know when to lower your voice, know when to get your point across, know when to kind of pass on to something else. And um, you've been very, 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 uh, very good to me, man, as far as not only your radio show, but how humble you've been and um, talking to me before the radio show. And uh, I thank you very much for appearing, man. I hope you have you back on one day we could talk wrestling again man i appreciate that thank you uh thank you very much and uh and good luck with the show thank you i appreciate it man have a good one man have a good evening you too all right man